Good morning, church. Grace and peace in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship this third Sunday of Easter. My name is Dawn Conti, and it is my joy to serve as pastor for this church, where our mission statement is to be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ, who know God and who through love serve the Lord and others. First Presbyterian Church is an inclusive and caring church, and we are passionate about helping others in our community and in the world. If you are an every Sunday worshiper, we're glad you're tuned in. And if this is your first time to wish worship with us, we warmly welcome you, and we're glad that you are here too. Although we are in different places this morning as we observe the shelter at home mandate, we are held together by the Spirit of God. Later on in our worship service, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And in these unusual times, we are going to follow the cues from our, the early church who broke and ate their bread at home, the book of Acts tells us, with glad and generous hearts. To participate, we invite you to make a few simple preparations. They are going to appear in your screen in your screen in just a moment. If you would pause the video and take time to prepare your table and your hearts to receive Lord's Supper and then restart the video once you are ready and resume worshiping with us. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to God in the call to worship. And I invite you to join me in reading the text that is in bold. Life has been revealed to us in this Easter season. Gather once more to testify to life. We declare to each other what we have experienced. In community, we find the life that God intends. Early believers were of one heart and soul. We too are called to find common ground in Christ. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Peace be with you as we celebrate resurrection. Christ is with us to renew our faith. We are here to testify to God's grace. We will share our story and ourselves.
Would you please join me in the reading together of the prayer of confession? We have taken the name of Christian, but few of us are known primarily by that name. We have experienced Easter radiance, but we seldom reflect the light of our risen Savior. We have heard the message of salvation, but it grows cold on our lips and is of little influence in our lives. Sometimes we delude ourselves that because we are basically good people, there is no sin in us. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Sin is separation from you. And we have allowed great chasms and built high walls to keep you out of our lives. Forgive us, we pray as we do our silent prayer of our own personal sins. Amen. We are assured of forgiveness. John wrote in the early church, if we walk in the light as Christ is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us. Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. When we are of one with God through Christ, we extend forgiveness to our sisters and our brothers, that all may come to the faith and have life in Jesus' name. Friends, believe in the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hi, kids, and welcome to church on this very first Sunday of the Merry, Merry Month of May. My name is Gay Wasik-Ziegel, and, well, it looks like May is going to be another stay-at-home month. But don't worry. There are a lot of exciting events that are going to happen in May. Next Sunday is a special day. Do you know what that is? It's Mother's Day. And what better time after all this time at home than to thank our mothers? You know, mothers don't ask for a lot. They just ask that we listen to them. They love it when we ask them for advice. And, well, also when we ask for permission because they have a lot of responsibility to take care of us and to make sure that we grow up in the right way. Which reminds me of a game that I used to play when I was young called Mother May I. It's not very hard. All you need is a start line and a finish line. Mother, one of the players, goes to the finish line and everybody else lines up, remember six feet apart, on the start line and the mother begins to give directions. She'll say to the first player, whose name might be Betty, Betty, take six tiny tiptoes toward the finish line. Betty will say, Mother, may I? And Mother answers, Yes, you may. And Betty takes her steps. The next player might be Bartholomew. So Mother says, Bartholomew, take three frog hops toward the start line. Bartholomew starts to hop and oops, mother says, uh, 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 because he forgot to say, mother, may I? Back to the start line, Bartholomew. And you continue on until someone finally reaches the finish line. That person becomes the mother and the game starts all over again. It might be a good game to play when you need a stretch break or you just want to laugh with your family. 
Well, this coming Mother's Day, remember, whatever you do, God says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first command with a promise that all may go well with you and you will live a long life on the earth. I think we all want that. So let's honor our Heavenly Father as well by listening to him, following his word, and asking for things in prayer. Would you like to have an echo prayer with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for our caregivers. Thank you especially for our mothers. Help us to honor them by asking for permission and by helping them out during these times. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye. And The first reading of the scriptures, and I'm sure you have your Bibles, that you turn to Psalms, and it's Psalm 118, verse 2 through 24. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph at those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence into the mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put our confidence in the princes. All nations surrounded me in the name of the Lord. I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They blazed like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I pushed and was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me in over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
today's sermon is the third in a series called Jesus Sightings. This particular scripture focuses on the time when Jesus appeared to the disciples for the second time in the upper room. Listen now for God's word to us from John chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 24 through 31. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in prayer. Ever-present, all-knowing, all-loving God, we thank you for your presence here today with each and every one of us. We give thanks for the gift of your living word, which has a new thing to say each and every time it is opened. Whether that is a word of courage, a word of comfort, or something else altogether, open our eyes, the eyes of our heart and of our minds, that we may hear what your Holy Spirit has to teach each of us individually and as your church. Then give us courage to live our faith in ways that reflect your grace. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Just as we might associate the biblical character Jonah with the whale, our first association most naturally with the disciple Thomas would be with doubt. But in reality, Thomas was no different than any of the other disciples. None of them, none of them, including Mary Magdalene and Peter and Cleopas and his companion, and those disciples that were present in the upper room the first time that Jesus appeared to them, none of them believed until they had seen Christ crucified and risen body with their own eyes. And even then, Matthew tells us that even after they had seen, of course they were joyful, but in their joy they were disbelieving at the same time and wondering So why should Thomas be any different from them? Thomas stands out for many reasons, but not because he was unique in his doubts. Thank goodness for Thomas, because Thomas was brave and true. Before his crucifixion, when Jesus was in Galilee with his disciples, he had predicted that he was going to go to Jerusalem, and there he would be rejected and crucified, And it was Thomas of all the disciples who spoke up and said, let us also go so that we might die with him. Thank goodness for Thomas. Thomas was the one who told it like it was. When the other disciples said, we have seen the Lord, Thomas would not accept their word for it. He was true to himself. And he said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and touch it, the, his nail-marked hands with my finger and his side with my hand, I will not believe. Thank goodness for Thomas. 
He is known as the twin. Do you ever wonder who the other twin was? I think the other twin is me. I think the other twin could be you. I think the other twin could be all of us because like Thomas, we want to know. How can we believe that Christ is alive unless we see him? Oh, there are many things in life that we may not fully understand or be able to explain, but we believe them. We can believe that the earth rotates around the sun, and we can believe that a seed, given the right care and condition, will become a plant. And we can believe that day changes to night and then back into day again, even though we might not totally understand how that happens. But ask us to make the central affirmation of our faith that Jesus Christ was crucified and on the third day rose again from the dead. Well, that's just a leap of faith that's a little more difficult to take. No, it's not too difficult at all to believe that Jesus was a wonderful preacher and teacher and healer. It's not too difficult to believe that Jesus was the best person who ever walked the face of the earth and that Jesus embodied the love of God more than anyone else. But when it comes to believing that a corpse comes back to life, that's another matter altogether. It's not as easy to believe something like that without proof. So when Thomas said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, some of us can relate. How can we believe that Christ is alive without seeing Christ? I believe that there is more than one way to see. We see with our physical eyes, and we can also see with the eyes of our heart. And together we are given different information, and they give us different ways of knowing. Our physical eyes can show us data and facts, but the eyes of our heart are, are testify to truth and make meaning. When our physical eyes see a sunset, we may see an array of beautiful colors, reds and oranges, sometimes purples, and sometimes pink. But when the eyes of our heart see that sunset, we see beauty. We see a beautiful gift from God that loves us enough to paint a brand new canvas across the sky just for us each and every day. When our physical eyes see an old country church, we may see things like a lawn that needs to be mowed or painting, peeling paint. We may see worn out carpet. But when we go inside of that church, the eyes of our heart may perceive a holiness where God's presence is palatable. When we see a newborn child with our physical eyes, we may see the likeness of that child's parents. We may see curly hair. We may see a dimpled chin. But we, when we view that newborn with the eyes of our heart, our spiritual eyes testify to the mystery of life, the endless new possibilities, joy, and hope. When we see our youth with our physical eyes, we're likely to see pink hair, tattooed arms and legs, or perhaps very tight blue jeans. But when we see our youth with the eyes of our heart, we recognize a beautiful child of God who is trying to make meaning and find a place in the world just like the rest of us. When we see something with our physical eyes, we are given data. But when we see with the eyes of our heart, they testify to the truth and make meaning. How in the world is this second sight available or possible? The psalmist says it like this, deep calls to deep. And 2 Samuel says that mortals see outward appearances, but the Lord, the Lord sees the heart. 
In his physical absence, Jesus has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts tells us that the Spirit gives us life, saying in, in the Spirit we live and we move and we have our very being. Jesus' Spirit resides in each one of us right here in our hearts. When we see with the eyes of our heart, the Holy Spirit empowers us and to embody the love of Jesus Christ to a broken world. And when that happens, Jesus starts showing up all over the place. Sometimes Jesus shows up in the lives of those that are well-known and well-to-do. Chef Jose Andres arrived to the United States from Italy about 20 years ago. At the time, he had $50 in his pocket, and today he is one of the most well-known and well-respected chefs in all of America. He and his wife established a nonprofit in 2010 called World Central Kitchen to feed the hungry. It provided meals for thousands of people in the wake of Hurricane Maria in 2017. And currently, World Central Kitchen is serving over 200,000 meals a day across the United States in various cities. Meals for the healthcare workers and also meals for those who are hungry. They've been doing this for the last seven weeks. But you don't have to be rich and famous to put skin on God's love. Jesus' presence often shows up in our family relationships. 80-year-old John Klein and his wife Anne have been married for 45 years. When the coronavirus reared its ugly head, the nursing home where Anne resides was locked down meaning that John could no longer make, you would think, his daily visits in the afternoon and early evening. But that didn't stop John. He showed up outside of Anne's window the very first day and every day since and has visited with her and talked with her and together the couple have sung familiar hymns. He says that he wants to spend eternity with Anne and he's looking forward to spending it with Anne and with Jesus. We see, when we see family members with the eyes of our heart, we see them the way God sees them. Many times the presence of Jesus shows up in our friendships. On April 17th, about 40 cars and one golf cart gathered together in the parking lot and made a caravan line um, of St. Raphael's Church in St. Petersburg, Florida. Some of the cars were decorated. They had signs on the side doors, and some of them had balloons, and other cars had soda cans that had been strewn together with string and tied to the bumper. And then, right at the appointed time, the car in the front of the line started its engine and turned out of that parking lot, and every other car followed parade style. Why? What in the world were we doing? Well, we were going to pass the home of our friend Lillian Harris, who was celebrating her birthday, and to let her know how much she was loved. Proverbs tells us that a friend loves at all times. When we see our friends with the eyes of our hearts, our relationships are transformed. During this season of pandemic, I have been so inspired by the many brave healthcare, grocery, and essential service workers, including the people from Amazon who deliver our packages and those who pick up our trash and our mail carriers, their willingness to show up and to serve day after day after day and put their own life and their own health on the line for people that are strangers. And Jesus said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick and you took care of me. Thank goodness for Thomas. For when Thomas saw Jesus with his own eyes, he came to that sweet spot in his faith and proclaimed, my Lord and my God. 
Thomas's affirmation of faith is the most complete affirmation of faith in all the Gospel of John. And I believe that Thomas was able to make that confession of faith because he not only saw with his physical eyes, but he also saw with the eyes of his heart. We, like Thomas and the early disciples, want to see Jesus. It's only human. After all, seeing is believing. But there is more than one way to see and experience the presence of Christ. As Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. We are the blessed ones. When we see with the eyes of our heart, our hearts are connected to God's heart, and we are inspired to go out into the world and to bring healing to many broken places while embodying the love of Christ. And at the same time, we are healed ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen. I can hear the heart's eternal ringing on the farther shore. As I hear those swollen waters with their deep and solemn and highly favored children of God. God has given us everything, not even withholding his only son, that we might have life and life in abundance, both now and forever. So with joy and thanksgiving in our hearts, let us return God's tithes and offer our gifts. During the season when we are physically apart, please remember that we are concerned about the ministries of the church and the well-being of the members of our employees' families. The financial viability of the church is dependent upon your generosity. So please continue to give generously. You may give online by going to our website, and there is a button on that website on the very home page, and all you have to do is click on it. It says Give. Or, of course, you may also send in your offering by U.S. mail. Thank you for the many ways that you continue to support First Presbyterian Church, St. Petersburg.
brothers and sisters, this is the joyous feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth, children, boys and girls, come. The scriptures tells us that people will come, God's people from north and south and east and west, to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. The Lord invites all those who love him to come. So come and participate in the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and just to give you thanks in every time and in every place, almighty God. We give you thanks for the gift of creation and especially for the gift of life. We are grateful that you have made us in your image and that you pardon us when we act as though you have no authority over our lives. We are grateful that you sustain us in your great love. And so with all your people, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise and magnify your glorious name, joining our voices in song. holy and blessed is your son Jesus Christ who was born of Mary and shared the joys and sorrows of the life that we know. You anointed Jesus Christ with your spirit to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to give sight to the blind, and to liberate the oppressed, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. In his baptism, suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and made us a new covenant with us by water and by spirit. We give you thanks, O Lord, that on the night when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, after he had given thanks to God, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the similar way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant or promise in my blood, which has been poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread, and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again in glory. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to take communion with me together. If you would pause the video and take time to prepare your table and your hearts to receive Lord's Supper and then restart the video once you are ready and resume worshiping with us. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. I 
I invite you to pray with me. Merciful God, we give thanks that you have invited us to this table. We give thanks that you have received us as members of the body of Christ and have affirmed us as a community of faith. Lead us to live as faithful and dedicated disciples in service to the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And now we raise our voices together in the prayer that he taught as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Alicia Ford. I'm the social worker here at Lakewood Elementary School. I've been here for two years. Um, just to kind of tell you a little bit about our families, we have um, over 300 kids here, and several of our families are homeless or dealing with you know, the things that poverty really brings up, along with having experienced this COVID-19 crisis. Um, about 30% of our kids are in foster care or homeless, and homeless doesn't always mean that our kids are living in a car. Several of them are staying with other family members or jumping from couch to couch. So one of the reasons we're doing this is to give our kiddos something to do and to really engage our families, you know, games, things like that. We often are called upon to give our families hygiene supplies. And while the school typically has a stock of those in, in for our scholars, we're, we're in need of more to be able to give them. So we want to, you know, give them games and, and, other things that we know that they are in need of and can't necessarily go out and acquire for themselves. Hi, my name is Stephanie Woodford and I'm the principal at Lakewood Elementary School. And I really want to take the opportunity to thank the church, the members, the congregation. Your support over the two years has been absolutely tremendous. Um, just to recap, two years ago, we were the lowest performing school in the state of Florida. The first year we grew over 65 points actually earned the D, but with a technicality um, on paper, still showing as um, a high F. This year, we were projected to be almost at a B. Um, and if, unfortunately, we will not have the opportunity to show those gains, but it is amazing what's going on in this school. And it's because of partners like you. As Alicia just said, so many of our families experience such trauma and, and, and the poverty impacts so much of their living. So Unita reached out to us again saying so many of you were asking how you can help. And collectively we came up with this wish list of educational items, hygiene products, and some food items that will stay on the shelf. Um, what we're thinking about doing is having a drive-through grocery store where we hand them just a little bit of everything uh, for the families that we know we could really support. So we wanna thank you um, we welcome you when this crisis is over to stop by any time. We're so proud of our school. Thank you.
As you leave worship today and you go into your week, be reminded, Christ has no body on earth now, no hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the hands through which Christ touches the world. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks with compassion onto the world. And yours are the feet through which Christ travels to do good. Christ has no body on earth now, no hands, no feet, on earth but yours. So go and be Christ's body. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>